All right, Joe's here. Now we can start. You? Morning. You know, there is another class, so it's not too late. <laughs> All right, in the interest of time, why don't we go ahead and get started? Um, one household note before uh, before we do get started, with apologies to Charlie for last week. So I realized that uh, having been in the Tuesday morning Bible study for a while um, and, and not been on this side of the podium for a while in a larger class, uh, a request is please raise your hand if you have a comment or a question. I was an offender last week and did not do that. And I realized in this larger setting, it's it's easier to manage everything and make sure everybody gets a chance to speak if, if you can just hold a hand up. And if I'm blind, please just you know wave it around a little and I promise I'll, I'll get to you. Um, let's go ahead and open with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, um, thank you for all the wonders of fall. Thank you for this world. Thank you for this church and this community. And thank you for this time to come together to consider scripture and your word and your will for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Welcome to Ephesians 5, part two. Well, second half. Anyway, um, verses 21 through 33. Um, quick note. So I did my best for you guys. Two pages, okay? So the first page has all of the text that we're going over today. It's the new standard revised version. So it's there for your reference. Um, then there's just an outline of some of my <laughs> maunderings and notes and concepts that we're going to be talking about today. And then on the back is the official Andy Coburn Reader's Digest version of um, nine guidelines from the PC, one of the two main PC USA. Um, official publications regarding interpretation of scripture and the nature of the authority of scripture. And I've put the, um, I've put the uh, URL at the top there. If you actually want this, it's actually two documents. Um, that is the actual URL. If you plug that in, you will pull up a PDF that's about 36 pages long. Um, that is a much fuller discussion of this topic. But these guidelines I thought might be helpful, um, and I put them in Reader's Digest version, not necessarily for you to read them all right this second, but um, I always find them very helpful when I'm studying scripture, and you may as well. The other thing I think you'll find if you go through it is they, um, I think regardless of what perspective you sort of come at scripture from, uh, the guidelines are pretty balanced, so for any of us who have the concern that every time we come up with a new interpretation of scripture, um, we're just reading in our own modern ideas. Um, it's it's got it's got the rule of faith, for example, which says we should respect and take a long look at what generations, literally centuries of Christians, have thought about scripture before we start deciding that some new shiny interpretation is the end all and be all. Um, but it's also got the rule of fallibility, which says, well, guess what? All those people who came before us, they're fallible humans too. So that doesn't mean that we just stick with um, past interpretations and there's no, no uh, room for movement forward in our understanding of scripture. Um, okay, so enough on that. And let's, uh, let's dive into Ephesians 5. Um, and just to get our heads moving, I'm going to read. I'm going to read parts of this as we go through. So, I start with verse 21. Sometimes people start with verse 22, but I think it's helpful to have that as a little bit of context, even if you don't consider it part of this section of the so-called household codes. Uh, be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, be subject to your husbands as you are to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, just as Christ is head of the church, the body of which he is the Savior. Just as the church is subject to Christ, so also wives ought to be in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, in order to make her holy by cleansing her with the washing of water by the word, so as to present the church to himself in splendor, without a spot or wrinkle or anything of the kind. Yes, 
so that she may be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as they do their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hates his own body, but he nourishes and tenderly cares for it just as Christ does for the church, because we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a great mystery, and, am I, and I am applying it to Christ and the church. Each of you, however, should love his wife as himself, and a wife should respect her husband. All right, so welcome to Ephesians. So why, do, why is this text problematical, uh, or potentially problematical? Um, well, pretty straightforward. If you're coming at this from a modern perspective where you come from a background of uh, assuming that um, men and women are generally should be equal and all that good stuff, you hit wives be subject to your husbands and you're like, oh, wow, that's interesting. What am I supposed to do with that? You know, and the, the principles that we've got um, you know, these guidelines, again, I find very helpful because you know, as soon as I hit that point, I confront the issue that I was talking about earlier, which is I'm concerned. I'm concerned that I have my, already have my views formed, some through the church and growing up in the church, of course, but some growing up in this era, being influenced by my parents and other people around me. And I have ideas about the role of men and women and how they relate with each other. So as a Christian trying to tra take scripture um, seriously, you know, when I get to problematic passages like this and I'm uncomfortable with them, I'm always very nervous that you know, how much of my reaction is just a, a knee-jerk reaction that I've observed certain values from society, and I don't see them reflected here in the Bible, and therefore, I, you know, I want to recoil from it. I don't want to, I don't want to go there. But, you know, I totally agree with the author of the book that we're using as kind of background material, um, uh, Taylor Gensch, that, you know, you can't do that. This is, this is Holy Scripture. Um, now, Again, we get into our interpretive principles to help us with this because this is one voice. I mean, um, another one of the guidelines interpreting scripture with scripture is both looking, you know, you can't just look at one line in Ephesians, right? We have to look, we're going to look at this whole section. We also need to look at this within the context of Ephesians. And then the bigger journey, of course, is how does this fit in with the whole rest of scripture? Everything from the the example of Christ in the gospels themselves to other things that are in the letters of Paul. Uh, for example, some of the things we've already touched on in earlier classes that Charlie touched on is, you know, this kind of is gonna run pretty smack into Galatians 28, I think it is, that talks about how we're all one in Christ and all these differentiations by gender, by um, master slave, all these relationships are, are um, done away with as we become members of the body of Christ. But the key is you can't just, you know, as Gensch points out, your, your answer here is you, you can't just run away and just say, oh, well, I don't like that part of scripture. Let's let's just ignore it. So let's dive in and let's talk about, um, and at any point, please, I'd welcome any thoughts, considerations, concepts, thoughts you've had, questions you've had. Um, I'm going to lead you on the Andy Coburn version of this based on, you know, various interpretations that I've read and all, but I'd love to get feedback and input as we go along. Hugh, did you have something? Now, and that's an excellent point. So let's put this all in a little bit of context. I mean, I want to dive into some of the specific language, like being subject. For example, one thing we're going to talk about is the fact that it says be subject. It doesn't flat out say just obey, you know, in the idea of somebody giving orders. It does say obey. When you get to the sections that we're not covering in here about children and slaves, it says flat out obey. And we're going to get to the part, of course, that we have this whole section here about husbands having obligations back. A little additional context to give you, let's let's talk about household codes, which is the first thing in my outline. Um, 
So the ancient readers would have been familiar with these so-called household codes, um, which seem to come primarily, well, out of the classic world, but from the secular world, things like Ar Aristotle usually is the, sort of the first name mentioned. And Aristotle had this idea of natural hierarchy, just the nature, you know, Aristotle wasn't drawing on uh, theological Christian ideas. He was just drawing on ideas of sort of the natural world and how, how it existed. And he, he, he wrote about the proper role of men just based on this is just the nature of things. Men are naturally created to command and women to obey and be submissive. Um, so a couple of things vis-a-vis -vis the house and the household codes, if you get online and you go around, I mean, Plutarch, uh, Plato may have even had one. Um, uh, Philo, a number of folks, and some in the Jewish heritage as well, uh, Greek Jews had had some of these household codes. Um, some interesting contrasts here are in those codes, those codes are addressed to the men. So one difference immediately, and that the readers of this time probably would have recognized is the first person addressed here is actually not the man, it's the woman, which is different. And later on, again, addressing children and slaves, I mean, that was not part of the standard household codes at all. So even that move to sort of acknowledge those, um, those other folks, folks who are not males as agents or people worthy of address is a notable difference. You know, where you take that and how far you take that is, you know, part of the analysis. Um, and so Hugh, you raise an excellent point too. I included verse 21 specifically because a lot of people do pick that up and say, oh, well, this language talks about being subject to one another. And as we get into this further and we talk about the language used, subject versus obey, and then why when it gets to the men, it doesn't say husbands sort of rule, command, direct your wives. It says love your wife. Well, again, that's very different from the household code formulation, which absolutely seem to have used, I mean, from what I've read, seem to have used that language of command and direction. Um, so that's another thing we need to unpack. Um, so thank you, Hugh. Great observation. Yes, I think that's absolutely something you need to take into account. I mean, to, to go the sort of the other direction, you do have to keep in mind, I mean, I, at least in my reading and thinking about it, to me, though, the fact that you're invoking the household code, though, does automatically fit you within, you know, the discussion is still within the paradigm of men being superior to women. And when we get to the language talking about, uh, well, when we get to it, it's part of the justification, the language just addressed to the wives specifically talks about um, just as Christ is the head of the church, the husband is the head of the wife. It's hard to get around the, the notion that there is an idea of superior and inferior there. Now, what that relationship looks like, we have a lot more to talk about um, as we go through this whole passage. But I find it a little challenging to just, again, sort of dismiss it. Um, so let me give you those. So those are a few initial thoughts. Let's, let's start working through the text and talking about some of these um, Well, no, sorry. One last comment I want to make on the on the household code: additional food for thought. Um, one one issue that often it comes well is always there when we talk about Paul is usually we look at what's the context of this letter, to whom it is addressed. Can we figure out the context? Can we figure out whether there are particular issues that Paul is trying to address, um, and things like that. Um, and a lot of the commentary I read said it's it's much harder to do with this letter. It's not nearly as specific as, say, in Corinthians. Yeah, and I'm counting on all the pastors and other people with serious training here to call me out or clarify and correct me as I go astray. Um, but this letter is much less in that in that vein. Um, but still, one thing to at least consider, and maybe it's a little too speculative to put any weight on it, is you know these household codes. If you're thinking, well, let me, let me give you a train of thought to, to play with. When you take this and then you look at Galatians and you say, well, if, if this is supposedly the same, obviously there's the historical question, right? This may not be the same person who wrote the letter to the Galatians, right? 
But if you're looking at the body of the Pauline letters and you look at Galatians and it's talk about equality and you take into account even within Ephesians, be subject to one another and some of the earlier discussion in here, which isn't, isn't about in Ephesians, is not about the man-woman relationship, but earlier on, Paul does talk again about uh, re the recurring issue of the, the divide between Gentiles and Jews and how that's been destroyed, that distinction has been destroyed. So that, that theme in Paul about how barriers have been broken down and we are all one in Christ and contrast it here. And then you say, well, we have the household codes. How do we, how, is there a way to make those make sense? How can we understand those together? One interesting thought, at least, and again, I'm not sure how far you take it and you may decide that it's not worthy, you know, it's not a good idea or it's not really well-founded anyway, but is it possible that using the household code is a way that he's trying to communicate with the community because he knows they'll understand the household code but it's being reformulated in certain ways to try and push them in a, in a direction. I mean, more in the direction of Galatians. And again, I don't think you can just say, aha, that's the answer. This is really the same Paul who just talks about equality the whole time. There's nothing in here about subordination that we really need to worry about. Because again, I think the, the sort of counter to that is by using the household co code in the first instance, a lot of the audience is going to drop into that that way of thinking and say, "Oh yeah, women are subject to men." And of course, through the through the you know history of Western Christianity, that's absolutely how this has been used, right? Women folk, you're supposed to obey your husband. That's it. I'm in charge or not? I'm the head. See, it says right here, verse 23. Um, yeah, husbands, it gets a lot more complicated than that. Well, let me pause for a moment. I'm sorry. I'm throwing out a lot of stuff here. Any initial comments, questions, thoughts, Mike? Right. And to be fair, I did see reference to one or two household codes. I think they might have been out of the Jewish tradition that did have this idea of um, treating your, your wife or your subordinates compassionately and treating them appropriately. So that idea is not completely um, foreign to all of the household codes. Um, and the last comment on the verses, these initial verses uh, addressed to the, to the wife, and I, I don't want to dwell on it now because I'd love to dive into the language addressed to the husband and develop the idea further. But remember that the, the, what's the nature of the subjugation here? It's you are to be wives, you are to be subject as the church is subject to Christ. That is not that is not a blind obedience. You just do whatever the heck I want, and you know, you're my property type con right? That's that's not the relationship of, of Christ and the church. So in these, you know, subject versus obey is already sort of a deviation from the classic formulation of just this sort of command control idea. And being subject is, as the church is to Christ, and we're going to get into this a lot more, that is not, that is not master-slave type, um, uh, type of relationship. 
Um, so let's let's get into the verses specifically address the husband and talk some more because there's a lot in these verses that gets to the same in my view gets to the same idea. So again, when we turn to the language about the husbands, what does it say? It doesn't say husbands, you are to command, direct, etc. Your wife. It says you're to love your wife. Well, again, that's that's very different from oh, the basic concept this here is just the guy says what you know tells the wife what to do, and then it re rapidly develops. You know, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave Himself up for her. Oh, wait. So your model of leadership is Christ leading the church. Well, a couple of key elements there, right? And, you know, with all due respect to the at least one conservative Christian tradition here, um, it's kind of breathtaking the way this passage has been used um, traditionally by some folks, because even on a even if you don't want to get outside of Ephesians at all, um, you know, the idea that this would justify any type of relationship that's sort of abusive or or not looking out for the welfare of the wife is absurd on its face. With this, when the when the leadership and the headship of the husband it put, is put in terms of as Christ loved the church and gave himself up. So let's do a quick reminder on the basics. Christ died for the church. That's your that's your model, husbands. That's the level of sacrifice you're supposed to go to. What else do we know about Christ's leadership? Well, the New Testament, including words out of a lot of words out of Jesus' own mouth, are about what? The first shall be last. Anyone who wants to be great shall be the servant of all. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. So, husbands, that's your model. Right now, does that again completely erase some of the stuff in here? But we're using a household co code, you know, paradigm as the basis for this conversation. Does that get rid of the fact that the language in in verse twenty two still says subject wives should be subject while husbands love? Now, Hugh, that gets back to your issue of you know, verse twenty one talks about be subject to each other. So all of these come together, but. You know, I think clearly if you're coming from a very conservative uh, perspective on this, I don't see how the text, I don't even see how you get going with that interpretation. <laughs> you're just as human as you are, Hugh. We're all human. Now, a good bit of the text goes on to talk about the relationship of, of Christ and the church. Um, I'm not going to dwell. Well, let's keep let's keep going. So there's, there's some additional language in here about Christ and the church talking about um, the church being a, a, a pure and holy body, et cetera, et cetera. Personally, that doesn't add a whole lot to the to the sort of discussion for me on these issues of exactly what's the relationship between husband and wife. Um, but, well, it's certainly fine. I just don't think that hits to, to the heart of it, gets to the heart of it. So I'm gonna skip ahead to the concept of, oh, I'm sorry, yep, Mike. Right. No, excellent point. And another thing I'll throw out as far as the, I'm going to generally stay away from translational issues because I'm totally incompetent on that point. But one one thing I saw in some of the commentaries was uh, some discussion about the word head and how that gets interpreted. 
And it seems, Mike, can you comment on that? The idea of source versus authority. And again, I'm not sure that's a that's not like a compelling argument in and of itself, but it's But anyway, so there are, there are senses of this word head that don't necessarily mean authority in terms of like, you know, commanding officer or a, or a political ruler. Um, as Mike said, that doesn't, that doesn't get rid of the issues entirely, but it's, it's, it's uh, worth noting. And if you were doing a more fulsome, not a 45 minute um, review of Ephesians 5, that, you know, that's the type of thing you'd want to get into. Um, let's see what's that. Right, and I will say, it seems to me that the analogy of the um, husband to Christ as head of the church, again, does, it's hard to get away completely from the notion of hierarchy with that. I mean, however much Christ may have loved us and served us and died for us, I don't think the church, we don't regard ourselves as Christ's equal. We know we're not. Um, so again, I don't think the, the challenges in Ephesians, just by looking at this part of Ephesians itself, you cannot whitewash this and just, you know, if, if you are uncomfortable with the idea of, of wives being subject to husbands or what that might imply, you can't just walk away from Ephesians and there's no pat, simple response that just sort of gets you off the hook. Um, Yeah, so now I want to I want to talk about the the, the body idea. Um, husbands should lo love their wives as they do their own bodies. Um, and this this of course ties into the idea of the church. It, it, it immediately also plays off of the initial analogy to Christ and the church because of course the church. Um, is analogized to, to being the body of Christ. And again, the, the notion of treating the, um, the wife being part of one's own body definitely does push back against sort of a classic household code idea of hierarchy where the man is on top and in command and the wife is a separate subordinate and just does whatever the man wants. Um, it, again, the body concept is not going to get rid of hierarchy. Again, with the analogy to Christ and the church, we don't, we don't regard the church as equal to Christ, even though we are part of the body. But this brings back the idea of unity, and it does there, therefore tie into um, really the earlier part of Ephesians and emphasizes unity in terms of Christ breaking down the barriers between Gentiles and Jews, and it definitely resonates with um, the Pauline theme through other letters, particularly, again, that classic line in Galatians about all being one in Christ. Um, the idea that the wife is not really separate, is not really separate from the husband, uh, but is part of the same unit, and that also goes to, uh, I mean, it softens the hierarchy, in my view, and it also uh, plays on the idea or raises the issue again of what does this mean in terms of what that relationship should actually look like? You know, if you're thinking about in terms of day to day, you know, again, a very conservative Christian reading of this is always translated into, well, the, the, the wife should just do whatever the husband says, and it doesn't really matter whether that's good or bad or indifferent. It doesn't matter how that plays out for the welfare of the wife. Um, this is a command and control thing. Um, this is yet another part of Ephesians that I think clearly pushes back against that. I mean, <clears throat> and Paul or the, the writer of the letter calls that out specifically. You know, a, a person doesn't hate their own body. You don't treat your, or at least you're not supposed to treat your own body poorly. So the the specifics, even if you take a more conservative view on this and you just want to hew to the Ephesians 5 and not get into the difficulties presented when you 
contrasted with some of the other parts of Paul, you've got this issue of, well, what does this really look like if we follow just even the words right here in Ephesians 5 and take them seriously? Um, and the body theme is throughout. I mean, it's because of the analogy with Christ and the church, um, the writer is talking specifically about love, uh, love your wife as you love your own body. Um, and then it finishes up with the idea of, you know, that classic line about for a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two will become one flesh. Um, and I'm talking, I'm still talking too much. Come on, thoughts, comments, Charlie? Right. Mike, sorry, and Doc, Doc, I'll get Mike in a moment. Don't worry, we saved the best for last. We've got, we've got Elliot and, and Ruth coming, fortunately, to rescue us. Thanks, Doug. Mike? Yeah, you know, the, the, uh, the first call on the fence was Charlie, and then Charlie worked really hard to get Julie to say yes to uh, <laughs> 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 the 
I was I was the last last option available. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Well, and Charlie, hang on one sec. And Charlie, back to you. Uh, to be fair, the, the uh, author, of course, talks about the mystery of the relationship between Christ and the church. So he uh, presumably he reflects on on that idea that there's, you know, the, there's a lot going on here and not all of it's so easy for us to understand and digest. That is very interesting. Which in the end sort of goes back to the unity, right? You, you need you need both together in order to create the whole. I mean, and, and if you if you want to follow the source idea, also um, in a similar but slightly different way, back to Genesis and the the version of creation where we have the rib. Um, in that sense, I mean, looking at that, man came from, or I mean, woman came from man, and yet they are they are the same, and they are both, you know, humankind in the image of God. So, I mean, if you start looking at some of some of the Genesis re potential Genesis ideas and reference that might be invoked by thinking in terms of source, um, at least if you go in that direction, you're not going to necessarily get any sort of inequality or hierarchy. Um, since both are made in the image of God. I'm sorry, who? Uh, Whitney. Thank you. Thank you. 
Can you say a little bit more about that and how that plays out for you in with this particular text? Right. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. Great. Thanks. Um, Mark had something, and then uh, apologies, but we probably better wrap up. Those of us in choir must flee for before Hank harasses us. Great. Thanks, Mark. Thank you all for your time this morning. Let us conclude with prayer. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this time together. Um, while we'll never fully understand your mystery, um, we thank you and the Holy Spirit for guiding us as we wrestle with your word. And we are grateful for all of the illumination that you grant to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.